Hello people, how are you? In this video, let us look at this uh, general surgery uh, final year paper. Okay, so this is general surgery as you can see, this is section A. So section A will have uh, about the abdomen kind of, that is a general rule. Let us look how uh, this has been framed. <clears throat> this is from the University of Karnataka, okay, RGUHS. So just first look at the pattern, okay. So are you focusing people? We are first looking at the pattern of this question paper. So what will be there uh, in this? Let me uh, write here. <clears throat> so you will have long essay, which will be 10 marks, okay, each, 10 marks each. And then you will have short essay, which will be 5 marks each, okay. Then you will have uh, short answers, which will be 3 marks each, okay. So let's start off answering the short answers. There are five of them here. Uh, this uh, paper actually totally adds up to 50 marks because the other 50 marks is given to orthopedics. Okay, and let us start off with this uh, first question here. Uh, short answers, split skin graft. We are starting with the smaller ones um, so that we uh, will be able to cover more in the first half an hour of the examination. That is your choice though. Okay, so let us go to split skin uh, graft now. What do you say people? <clears throat> okay, so uh, look at this. Uh, so skin graft is uh, a way of covering wound. So you have a wound somewhere like they have shown in this photo. You will want to cover it with a skin from the donor site. So you have two types of skin grafting. Focus here people. Two types of skin grafting is there. You have the split skin graft and you have the full thickness graft. Okay, so in split skin graft you are taking the epidermis and a part of the dermis. So you are taking the epidermis and part of the dermis. So this is partial thickness graft. <clears throat> so the donor site doesn't have to give too much, right? Um, so he can heal easily. He has to heal just part of the dermis and the epidermis, correct? So the donor um, will ha will be able to heal better, right? And uh, later once he heals again, you can take repeated grafts from that area. And uh, uh, the thing with this is what is bad about this is it is not cosmetically that appealing. But anyways, it doesn't matter because you're not doing it on the face. Mostly what we do it is like if there is a wound like this or an ulcer like this, which is healthy for this to cover it like this looks like the leg, right? So here you can put a split skin graft, right? So once they have covered it, this is how it looks. And this is the Humbi's knife from which they are going to extract this uh, split skin. So the full thickness graft, which is also called as a wolfy graft, that where you are taking the full thickness of the dermis along with the epidermis. So uh, basically this you will do when you want very good uh, cosmetic appeal, right? So please focus here. This is uh, this full thickness graft you will do when you want a very good cosmetic appeal. So maybe on the face or something, right? Um, like f even then very, very uh, particular that they are doing. So the donor who is giving, the donor site actually will have to give a lot, right? So they will not be able to donate repeatedly and they will not be able to heal faster also, right? So this is something about the other uh, uh, full thickness graft. So uh, when will you do it? Like we told you, if there is a healthy ulcer because of either trauma or surgery or some uh, venous ulcer, diabetic ulcer, because of something there is a skin opening which you want to close. <clears throat> Contraindications when you should not do. See, look at this uh, this wound. It looks healthy, right? So the wound should be healthy. There should be no infection there, uh, especially from the beta hemolytic streptococci because they will produce the fibrinolysin which can dissolve this uh, fibrin. So there basically it will not stay, right? The graft. So you should be careful about this uh, area. It should not have any infection. Uh, am I making any sense? And there should be no exposed bone, right? So whenever there is such things, you will have to take more than this, just the skin. You have to take a flap which will have a blood supply. This will not have its own blood supply. So this you should understand. Split skin graft or skin graft will not have its own blood supply. If it has its own blood supply, it's called as a flap. Okay. So here they're saying it should be a vascular wound. Means what? That means it should be able to provide blood to that skin that you are providing it. So you're not going to give any blood supply. You're just going to give the layers of the epidermis and partial dermis. So basically the vascularization has to happen on the wound. Right? <clears throat> and once they do the split skin graft, they will immobilize the area with a POP slap if you have seen it in the ward. Right? And then after some time it will just fall off because the Epidermis will grow and it will throw off this uh, POP by itself. Uh, we know that it is just for three marks, but just focus here on one more point. The process of graft take. 
how was the graft taken right so the graft will initially adhere to its new bed by fibrin that is why they are saying you should not have any fibrinolytic uh, agent there so because it will adhere using the fibrin so that, uh, can i highlight this yeah so basically um <clears throat> uh, that's why you should not have any infection there right for not just infection obviously infection is bad but it should not be beta hemolytic because it will break this fibrin then it will revascularization will start in 48 hours this is what is important you should say this and it will complete in four to five days this is just about the blood supply they are telling right then <clears throat> From where is the skin uh, which you gave the skin graft from where is de deriving its nutrition Fri directly from the wound right by the process of serum imbibition or plasmatic circulation so from where is the skin that you put there how is it going to get the nutrition so that it can survive it is going to survive by serum imbibition plasmatic circulation by directly from the wound it is getting the nutrition unlike a flap flap is something where you are taking tissue which along with its vascularity <clears throat> so split skin graft you are taking without vascularity time to go to the next question ankle brachial pressure index what does this uh, sound like ankle ankle is uh, in the leg and brachial is on top so ankle brachial pressure index some kind of a pressure difference between these two they are looking at okay so you'll have to measure the bp here and here and compare that's what it looks like let's see well it is not the difference it is the division and ankle is on top okay so you have to pay attention attention here people ankle is on top so the leg part is on top right and then you have the hand part here that is the brachial uh, blood pressure so this is the ankle brachial pressure index so <clears throat> using a spigmo manometer that is your uh, bp measuring machine which you use right so basically here you will measure the systolic blood pressure so we are looking only at the high value and uh, <clears throat> look at this so the ankle blood pressure systolic will be more that's what they are saying okay <clears throat> so the leg will be more and the hand will be little less okay so that is why they're saying normally what will happen if this is more what will happen the values are always above one okay normal people you may etc the value will be more than one that means the ankle pressure is more <clears throat> correct now uh, what happens in people who have some uh, uh, this uh, vascular obstruction we are talking about uh, um, peripheral vascular disease so what will happen here there's less blood let us say because of some vascular obstruction they're saying and here there is more blood so what will happen the pressure in the leg will be less so that time this value will become less than one so that will indicate that there is some vascular obstruction less than one is bad so we have put it in red you can understand okay if this ankle pressure which is saying systolic if it's less than 30 millimeter mercury that means gangrene may be emittent that means this tissue will go into death because it is not getting enough blood supply okay so you'll have to probably immediately intervene etc what uh, we are trying to say here is basically it indicates peripheral vascular disease and uh, in diabetic foot what they are saying is in diabetic foot uh, this is ankle brachial pressure index is misleading because of calcified vessels which are incompressible okay <clears throat> so that is another point to note so here they are mostly focusing on the peripheral vascular disease okay so um, what are the examples of peripheral vascular disease atherosclerosis burgers disease all that that is why they are asking you to measure so here they are showing the tao patient tao is just nothing but burgers uh, disease right um, and here you can see how there is gangrene right ulcer is this an ulcer skin pinched and ridged nails so that is thrombo angitis obliterans right so it is usually seen in smokers people who smoke right their uh, blood also will be hypercoagulable co coagulable please and uh, what are they talking about so the small and medium sized vessels such as the dorsal spedis artery popliteal for sorry posterior tibial popliteal arteries these are involved they didn't say artery they said the vessels are involved so could be the veins also just write a word on the treatment so you have uh, non uh, surgical and surgical so basically you have the you want to relieve the pain with tablets you want to have some positions uh, where they will not have so much pain right then you can have some vasodilators they're not found useful they're saying then we'll just not highlight this okay no wait what they're saying is vasodilators are useful in uh, tao patients but not in the atherosclerotic patient okay so that is something that we will have to learn the examples of the drugs are pento pentoxifilin, right prostacyclin wow 
So in the medical manage management, they are telling about aspirin. So it dec decreases the vascular death percent. You don't smoke, yeah. Don't have too much of lipid, this junk food. Then you can give them some anti-hypertensives. Okay. Anti-diabetic treatment. Okay. Vasodilator again. Then there is some sympathectomy which they are doing chemically or surgically. Okay. So what they are doing is um, lumbar sympathectomy. Okay. Why are they doing this? They are removing the nerve. So they want to remove this pain. So indication is pain. Rest pain. What is this? Omentoplasty. Omentoplasty has been tried. Okay. Omentum. Omentum is something to do with the abdomen, right? Greater omentum. Okay. So then you have the conservative amputation because if the, it's already gangrenous, what do you do, right? Then they're talking about below knee amputation, which is really, really rare. Okay, so now let us continue and look at the next uh, question here. Fresh frozen plasma. Are you able to see? This is the next question that we have to look at. Fresh frozen plasma, three marks only. So uh, let's look at it. Uh, we have to write uh, this answer. So there's a donor blood that is given here, right? Then you will test it for all this HIV, hepatitis B, etc. So you have put it in this bag and then you will centrifuge, right? So you are going to make this separate into blood components. So you will remove the WBCs. Right, WBCs you are not using, okay, at all. So then you have in one packet, uh, you have this red blood cells, okay, focus people here. So here you have the RBCs in one bag, right, it came to one bag. Then you have the fresh frozen plasma, the platelet cells here. So you have removed the red blood cells and the platelets and then you have the fresh frozen plasma, right, did you get it? So now this uh, fresh frozen plasma, you can cryoprecipitate it and make it concentrated plasma. But here they are talking about this fresh fresh frozen plasma. What will this have? So it will have coagulation factors, okay, immunoglobulins that is antibodies. It will have human albumin, plasma volume expander. So main thing it will have this, okay. So what it will have? Coagulation factors, antibodies it will have and plasma volume expander. So obviously you will test the blood for everything then you will also do cross matchings and all that and then you will have to give it to the recipient, fresh frozen plasma. But why would you give it to somebody? So abnormal coagulation tests if people have, if there's active bleeding, right? So if they have deficiency of coagulation factors, then only you have to give this fresh frozen plasma. So let us read more. It is to prevent bleeding prophylactically, to stop bleeding if it is happening. Okay. Plasma exchange also for plasma exchange also they are writing. So here they are telling this fresh frozen plasma should be ABO compatible and you should transfuse it within 24 hours of thawing. Okay. That means once you remove it from the fridge and uh, uh, kept it in room temperature within 24 hours, very soon you have to transfuse, okay. Actually in surgeries, right, they try to find the donor uh, prior to the surgery and plan for whole blood itself, isn't it? Uh, that's how we have seen in our hospital. So look at this, there is something called as MTP, massive transfusion protocol is there. See, they are saying here, the, not a justification for the use of fresh frozen plasma. You should not give if there's hypovolumia. Okay. You should not give. Only if there is some uh, factor, uh, coagulation factor deficiencies, right? TTP, thrombos, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. If you want massive transfusion, right? Only in such cases, they are talking about giving FFP. How about moving on to the next question, hypokalemia. Here people, hypokalemia, that means potassium is less. What will happen? Some old notes we found. So basically, serum potassium level is below what? Uh, 3.5 milli equivalent per liter. Okay, so there is hypokalemia. So uh, <clears throat> look at this. Uh, why is there uh, hypokalemia? Because either there is... Yeah, loss is more, maybe they are taking diuretics I feel or they are uh, having less potassium intake or they have some transcellular shift. Obviously, intake is less or output is more or transcellular shift is there. Okay, so these are the reasons for hypokalemia that have done very, very generally. Okay, then vomiting is a cause of hypokalemia. Please pay attention here. Vomiting is a cause of hypokalemia. It will, you will vomit out everything. You will vomit out everything. Even potassium is gone. 
right then uh, uh, so this will result in what metabolic alkalosis i want to write here metabolic alkalosis so uh, vomiting is one of the cause now let us go here causes of hypokalemia so basically there is a loss increased loss from your body that is because of renal you're taking some uh, uh, loop uh, diuretics or thiazide diuretics uh, say the names of these loop diuretics furosemide torsemide etc right then uh, they are also taking some other drugs they are telling here or there could be acidosis of the renal tubules okay cystic fibrosis a um, lot of syndromes they have mentioned here cushing syndrome they can have hypokalemia is it then diarrhea vomiting sweating also okay please pay, pay attention here these are the first things you should try diarrhea vomiting st uh, sweating then you are now in decreased intake because of malnutrition uh, etc and uh, intracellular shift that is uh, in the treatment of uh, dka diabetic ketoacidosis because of the treatment it can happen okay so they are giving high insulin high insulin state remember insulin insulin high insulin will lead to what hypokalemia so remember when you are treating any patient with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis etc when you are giving insulin you should be wary of this uh, hypokalemia so what will happen if there is less potassium potassium less so let's write here potassium is less so we have less potassium so what will happen no pot no tea that's what we remember right so no potassium no tea so t wave will not be there or it will be suppressed is it the ecg okay so where are we okay so what happens if there is hypokalemia look at this okay so, uh, symptoms will be non specific okay so you won't know what they are telling uh, that's what they see here see symptoms are non specific and predominantly related to muscular or cardiac function but if there is severe uh, hypokalemia so normal what did they say is 3.5 less than 3.5 milli equivalents per liter however if it is severe that means if it is less than 2.5 then what will happen it may there may be neck flop abdominal distension basically muscle weakness they are saying yeah, this um, ileus so basically there will not be much of uh, uh, what am i saying some paralytic ileus or something right that what that's what we remember reading now then what will happen there will be uh, cardiac arrhythmias we told you right the heart no pot no tea that kind of situation and um, uh, if there is chronic hypokalemia then there can be uh, some renal disease which is associated which you will have to check okay hypokalemia increases the risk of digoxin toxicity so it uh, if there is hypokalemia if you are giving digoxin right it will increase the toxicity risk so that's what you have to remember so the treatment uh, for this patient basically you'll have to treat um, uh, whether if it is associated with hypertension or acidosis or alkalosis so it can be either of them so you'll have to treat this uh, you'll have to check this uh, hypertension also why it is happening you can know whether it is primary hyperaldosteronism um, something to do with your uh, aldosterone um, uh, levels right primary hyperaldosteronism renal artery uh, some stenosis okay some stenosis of this renal artery so what it's doing because it is uh, um it is going to be having hypertension okay pay attention here some adrenal hyperplasia adrenal hyperplasia something they're blaming here congenital adrenal hyperplasia then uh, glucocorticoid remedial hypertension or liddles syndrome wow these are all very very high fi terms okay then um, uh, there can be some ba bar barter barter or gitelman syndrome okay some tubular disorder tubular disorders tubular disorder here again there is paralysis see they are saying acute flaccid paralysis they have written here so basically here they again landed up explaining the cause of the problem and they are saying treat that okay and then what they are saying here uh, how will you treat let's use a green for this wait how will you treat so basically you will uh, uh, or losses if they are there you uh, reduce the losses by stopping this uh, diuretics right or if you are giving alpha 2 agonists you stop that then uh, potassium you give the person potassium you replace the potassium stores by oral or intravenous administration of potassium chloride right and then if there is some specific disease then you treat that like barter and gitelman syndrome how will you treat that by giving indomethacin angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors ace inhibitors give an example of ace inhibitor so here you have your enalapril right enalapril enalapril etc when they said you have to give them potassium chloride how do you give there are tablets here a lot of multivitamins they are seeing here potassium chloride tablets 
there's some electrolyte also they are seeing there is some KCL injection potassium deficiency did you ever see this injection being given see here itself they have written potassium chloride 15 percent this is the uh, you will give IV infusion over one to three uh, one to two hours okay and how to give so much it should not exceed all this if you get you will get too many too many marks then you have oral supplementation so you have injection that is IV IV injection then you have oral supplementation and then uh, stop and replace losses if it is happening okay so normal saline volume resuscitation they are seeing okay correct hypomagnesemia so basically underlying uh, etiology you have to fix magnesemia this hypomagnesemia magnesium is mg right yeah so basically in surgery textbook what they have given is normal potassium levels is 3.5 to 5.5 so if it is going going beyond uh, below 3.5 then it will become hypokalemia right and the causes is reduced intake tissue redistribution increased loss renal causes okay so the symptoms will be anorexia nausea muscle weakness paralytic alias and uh, uh, the cardiac, uh, we told you, right, reduced height of uh, T wave, uh, etc. A lot of other things they are telling you. Then how will you manage? You will find the uh, cause and treat and you will also replenish these uh, body stores. And then uh, you can give uh, milk, fruit juice, tender coconut water, they are saying. Then syrup potassium chloride orally and if patient cannot take orally or if you need uh, to give IV, then you will give IV potassium chloride at the rate of this. And uh, if there is any life-threatening arrhythmia, it should not, so you should not give it at a rate exceeding of this, okay. And you should keep do my monitoring ECG, that's all, okay. That is why as routine investigations, we always order uh, serum electrolytes. Serum electrolytes will have three components in it, you will have the sodium. And then you have the potassium and then you'll have the chloride. What is this fourth one? We didn't see that in our hospital. Enough about hypokalemia. Let's go to uh, the next question. Last one here, Virchow's triad. Virchow's triad. So this Virchow, so many words are there. Virchow nodes are there, etc. But they have asked about Virchow triad. Let's look at this. Virchow's triad is talking about which, which subject Virchow described three primary events which predispose a thrombus formation. Oh, a thrombus formation here. So, okay, let me focus here. Virchow described three primary events which uh, predispose a thrombus formation. This is a Virchow's triad. So, you have an endothelial injury. So, if there is a blood vessel or something, endothelial. Inside the blood vessel, there is an injury, right, to which there is an altered blood flow and then there is a hypercoagulity of the blood. So, there is a thrombus here in this uh, artery looks like to this there are other uh, uh, add uh, to this uh, are added the activation process that follow these primary events so there's activation of platelets and clotting system so same thing they have explained a lot here so first there's endothelial injury then there's role of platelets then the coagulation system then the altered blood flow and then the hypercoagulability what is this the triad had only three things right the endothelial injury, altered blood flow and hypercoagulability. I thought only these three were there. So here you go, endothelium, red blood cells, in subendothelial collagen. So they are showing leukocytes here, fibrin strands, etc. Here they are showing you a normal axial flow. And here they are showing marginalization and pavementing. This is the alteration in blood flow, okay. And there's this hypercoagulable state because of which happens because of all these factors uh, and uh, obviously heart diseases and uh, <clears throat> prolonged bed rest can cause a thrombosis, cigarette smoking, obesity, right? Late pregnancy also, certain drugs like oral contraceptive pills, etc. So basically, uh, they're talking about thrombosis, thrombosis, thrombosis. What was the question they asked you in the exam? Virchow's triad, right? So this uh, paper you no know, sounds like a medicine paper, right? But actually you have to attend, um, you have to address the surgery part in it. So why are they asking you Virchow's triad about thrombosis? Why does thrombosis happen? Because of deep pain thrombosis they are concerned, right? So deep pain thrombosis you should know that it will be usually unilateral with pain, right? Uh, there is um, uh, um, because of immobilization, etc., right? There is a thrombosis in the deep vein. Remember it is deep, right? And... Uh, it can also happen due to surgery. Wow. So in post-operative period, let us say they are on the bed, uh, right? Uh, there will be edema of this leg. You can see erythema, dilated veins, right? And there is a dull nagging pain in the calf muscle. 
and uh, a low grade fever can be there then there is phlegmasia alba dolens alba is what why is alba heightened obstructed deep ve venous channels and not what's not what did i write that there okay so there can be white leg blue leg and there are some signs we should know for uh, uh, thrombosis what are the signs the deep vein thrombosis hof homans homans test forcible dorsiflexion will uh, of the foot results in severe pain in the calf region then you have the moses test that is the bancroft sign ha i have written here so basically on pressure not squeezing so on pressure there is tenderness over calf muscle okay so you will do a doppler study to see if there is a thrombosis and then what else you can do a venography so here you can see that it is unilateral i can see swelling here i'm thinking this is the right leg right so this leg is swollen possibly dvt right and it responded to low molecular weight apparent so the cure also they're telling you in this image itself so how will you uh, treat this condition dvt deep uh, venous thrombosis deep vein thrombosis so they are saying don't confuse it with uh, filariasis okay so uh, there should be elevation of limbs right so the edema will reduce but this uh, thrombosis should not this thrombus should not shift and uh, cause any other uh, embolism right am i saying it right so there should be heparin that you should give they are saying and you should check the aptt at this uh, when you are giving heparin so heparin is the solution warfarin is an oral anticoagulant okay then low molecular weight heparin so heparin low molecular weight heparin okay and then um, some filters they are talking about surgery why will you will you do surgery no we don't do surgery but there are some surgery names what are the complications permanent edema of the limb can be there the limb can has an inverted beer bottle appearance so that is what we are seeing how will a beer bottle be so beer bottle will be something like this do you have time for me to draw it some beer bottle will be like this so it will be an inverted beer bottle right that's what they are saying champagne bottle appearance so the leg will look swollen like this and this will be the ankle and foot i'm guessing right so uh, there can be an embolism like we told you pulmonary embolism if the thrombus is not attached to vessel wall it can move and cause an embolism right then uh, non healing ulcers secondary varicosity can happen non healing ulcers can happen i think for a three mark questions we discussed way too much basically when they said thrombosis no in the question paper um, what they are telling is very um, that is virtuostriad okay they asked for virtuostriad uh, they talking about how a thrombus forms but this virtuostriad why are they asking in surgery paper and the two for three marks right so at least six points should be there so the triad you will write then you can draw some diagrams to always get some marks and then you will also explain that deep vein thrombosis symptoms etc so people um, we have finished the short answers okay so that's a great uh, achievement now let us look at the short essays systemic inflammatory response syndrome so uh, in our video we have already covered this see sirs is here systemic inflammatory response syndrome Ses sepsis is a type of sirs which happens because of infection okay but if it is not because of infection then it can be uh, what are the other causes it can be because of uh, uh, pancreatitis burns trauma others pancreatitis they are talking about the non infective looks like the alcohol etc so basically the, the all this can lead to systemic inflammatory response syndrome this is uh, something to do with an exaggerated uh, a defense response of the body okay so uh, then let's go here so what will happen here two or more of the following will be there there'll be a higher temperature or a lower temperature there's a heart rate so there's a tachycardia here respiratory rate is here that is tachypnea and uh, the carbon dioxide they're saying is less because they are breathing very fast right and the total leukocyte count will be great or less so it can be leukocytosis leukopenia and um, 
what is this greater than 10 percent of immature cells so basically can you say what is this uh, sirs sirs systemic inflammatory response syndrome so you are understanding that it is uh, a exaggerated defense uh, of the uh, body so uh, why can it happen sirs it can happen because of infection that uh, in bracket you put sepsis this is a one part of it then you have trauma then you have pancreatitis and then burns etc and others also they have put something so basically there's exaggerated systemic response uh, inflammation inflammatory response syndrome inflammation this is referring to so uh, what exactly uh, are the parameters there is uh, tachycardia tachypnea uh, temperature is high or low and then uh, there is uh, what else we saw that leukocytosis so the total leukocyte count you can say so it is more or very less with immature cells so all tttts huh? it's an easy way to remember let's make that note here so t is for temperature t is for uh, tachycardia and then t is for either tachypnea or uh, tachypnea or uh, yeah tachypnea only and then total leukocyte count all t's so the four t's you can remember four t's of systemic inflammatory response syndrome okay so now look at sepsis and septic shock sepsis again there, there's infection there is hypotension and tachypnea altered metastasis etc so that's what low bp so hypotension now this uh, you will try to con correct with intra uh, venous fluids right but then still if you cannot correct then if there is persistent hypotension this is called as septic shock okay so this uh, in this case you'll have to give vasopressors uh, to maintain the map mirror arterial pressure so one of the vasopressors you know which we give commonly is noradrenaline right norad norad we'll call it as okay what is this saying serum lactate greater than 2 millimoles per liter so how will you treat if it is sepsis if it is infection obviously you will give uh, antibiotics and uh, uh basically if you required they'll give oxygen iv fluid then you will measure the serum lactate and you will take blood blood count etc blood culture also you will know because it's infection that you're suspect uh, su suspecting right so that is how you will treat um, uh, sepsis but otherwise sirs how will you treat also right treatment of pancreatitis two lines uh, basically it will be nilpur oral etc to give rest for the pancreas etc burns how will you treat that also you're right so you have the cold water bath they are taking as first aid then you have uh, whether it's partial sickness or full thickness etc the rule of nine walls rule right this is what is what uh, they may at expect you to say walls rule wallless rule so basically you know that 9% 9% 9% uh, genitalia is 1% it will add up to 100% right so how much of percentage is there then you will calculate the uh fluid volume that you require right you have to mainly know the sparkland formula 4 ml per, uh, per into uh, dip, what is it 4 ml into percentage of burns into the number of weight of the patient, patient kg in the first 24 hours you will give okay and how will you give half you will give in the first 8 hours quarter in the next 8 hours each okay 8 8 8 24 hours yeah so there are types of burns etc they are explaining here then you will also give antibiotics in this case okay and what is the fluid that you give ringer lactate you should give crystalloid not colloid that you remember crystalloid ringer lactate should, you can give don't give colloid see do not give colloid in first 24 hours see this paper they have designed very much like a medicine paper so what exactly do you write here for surgery right systemic inflammatory response syndrome okay then they have asked femoral hernia looks like they have cancelled the question to indications of blood transfusion and its complications femoral hernia because i am thinking it's below the abdomen they didn't want to include it in the surgery one paper anyways this again becomes a very medicine type of topic indications for blood transfusion and what are the complications of blood transfusion all that you can write let's move on to the next question people what do you say or do you want to look at the blood transfusion complications see already blood transfusion one question was already there in the short um, answers i don't know why again in the short essay they have included anyways complications of blood transfusion you can have hemolytic reactions because of immune okay so you can have uh, hemolytic reactions are able to see here then you have non hemolytic reactions okay so um this can there can be major apo incompatibility okay but this should have done a cross matching anyways major and minor etc uh, have you seen all that in the blood bank how they do the cross matching etc but this can still be a incompatibility which can lead to hemolysis which will have features like hematuria pain in the loins fever chills etc that's why always they transfuse the blood slowly okay to and observe the patient's bp and the temperature every time you have seen how they do blood transfusion in the ward 
then oliguria can be there so you have to be careful about that then minor in in minor reactions can also be there then coming to non hemolytic reaction they can be febrile reaction allergic reaction so you should be very careful if they have some kind of itching sensation etc so you have to treat with antihistamine if required then um, uh, there can be lung injury trolley transfusion related acute lung injury guys focus here uh, there can be congestive cardiac failure so that's why you should not give rapidly or you should not give whole blood rapidly okay then uh, you should always have checked the blood for all this uh, hepatitis hiv etc but this is a very rare chance that you would have probably come negative but it might be positive i think i don't think you should write that in the exam anyways then uh, massive blood transfusion what can happen if you give there can be a disseminated intravascular coagulation the blood will coagulate right and if you give too much of uh, blood there can be an iron overload so you will you can treat it with desferoxamine which is a chelating agent what is short short is serious hazards of transfusion okay so they have given some what you should do you should stop if there is some reactions what will you do that they have written here let's look at this discontinue the transfusion give chlorpheniramine because it's antihistamine give oxygen fluid support give salbutamol salbutamol nebulizer etc if it is an allergic reaction then uh, if required if this hypertension adrenaline they are talking about then for each thing they are telling how to manage also okay i think uh, there is no not much of requirement to go into all this too much in detail so uh, did you understand the the complications how you will manage them basically stop the transfusion one point that we didn't address and this is the indications of blood transfusion remember for whole blood cell uh, when will you do whole blood cell only in emergency probably the like, way too much of emergency they will give a whole blood cell otherwise you will give rbc's only if the person has anemia etc if the person has uh, dengue and platelet levels are falling etc what will you give platelet in platelet also you have so many types of platelet right and then you have this uh, fresh frozen plasma which we spoke of where you are giving if there is uh, any co coagulation factors you want uh, for that person then you have something called as a cryoprecipitate when will you give that also you can write indications for each one if you write it is better okay and then complications we told you in general looks like this cryoprecipitate has this fibrinogen so if they have this hypofibrinogenemia they're giving if they are going to have some major procedure for this patient before that they can give so basically we were looking at this uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome right in the previous uh, question in that that the uh, wallus uh, nine, rule of 9 i'll just show you see here 9% 9% front 99 uh, and yes shall we go to the next question non hodgkins lymphoma again this uh, what is the surgical thing that they are looking here non hodgkins lymphoma so you have hodgkins lymphoma and non hodgkins lymphoma and they are asking only this in the exam why 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 in surgery paper looks like we need to go back to basics okay so here they are talking about this is a lymphohematogenous disorder hematopoietic disease malignancy so basically there is a solid mass that mostly involves lymph nodes okay it involves mostly what lymph nodes that's why it's a lymphoma okay so hodgkins lymphoma is not that common non hodgkins is more common okay then they should have put this more common one first on this side what do you say people So this Hodgkin's lymphoma, ma'am. No, it is continuous. It is a continuous, a continuous spread in an orderly fashion from one lymph node to the other, and there is better prognosis in a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, so what is affected here? Lymph node. Very good. So uh, Hodgkin's is from B cell. Non-Hodgkin is ninety percent from B cell and ten percent from T cell. Okay, and it may spread to blood. So everything about this non-Hodgkin's is red. And what they have asked you in the exam is uh, non-Hodgkin's. So they are talking about Waldeyer ring and mesenteric nodes are commonly involved. Waldeyer's ring is that tonsils, right? So here they are showing you the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, pretracheal lymph nodes, and upper neck nodes. So basically, they already told you, right? Waldeyer's ring, etc., will get affected. So you should always differentiate it from other causes, right? Tuberculosis, metastasis, etc. So coming to the surgery part of it in the surgery textbook, what they are saying is you have uh, the causes they are telling here. In which age group it is there? The causes are the virus. and then uh, d all the virus basically virus they are blaming virus only so basically the b cells it can arise from or t cells that's what they said right then you have the burkitt's lymphoma that they are telling even bacteria can cause um, this um, like h pylori in gastro gastric extra nodal marginal b cell anyway is the same thing then coming to immunodeficiency also it can cause um, 
non hodgkins lymphoma so you have low grade intermediate grade high grade high grade is this burkitts or uh, basically there is uh, lymphoblastic variety so just say there are three varieties low grade high grade and all that right um, burkitts is this uh, high grade they are saying so you have classification it is from uh, pathologically it is either from a b cell or a t cell what else should i tell you so we already saw this in pathology notes so how will you treat first you will grade the tumor you will stage the tumor <clears throat> then uh, standard things like radiotherapy chemotherapy etc so here <clears throat> they have shown you the different sites of uh, lymph nodes in uh, <clears throat> non hodgkins lymphoma it's seen in more elderly this uh, non hodgkins looks like okay tonsils like we told you waldeyer's ring right then what they are telling you is it has poor prognosis and whatever they told you is about uh, chemotherapy only nothing surgical they told so far in the treatment right okay so let us look at the last part of this uh, that is the long essay describe the etiology pathogenesis clinical features and management of carcinoma tongue correct carcinoma tongue that's what it looks like for 10 marks you have to explain carcinoma tongue so first always start off with the ad, uh, anatomy also so looks like what we look at is the dorsum of the tongue so here they are showing you the <clears throat> fungiform papillae filiform papillae foliate papillae circumvallate papillae then here you are showing you the palatine tonsils i do you know where i am pointing yeah the palatine tonsils here right and then they are showing you the vellicula okay so this is the tongue and here they are showing you the inferior surface of the tongue where they are showing you the frenulum what are they showing you the frenulum is in the middle then you have uh, the deep lingual vein and then you have these things which are the plica fimbriata okay draw diagrams you will get marks a uh, very simple ones also just draw them and here they are telling you the extrinsic muscles of uh, tongue you have some extrinsic muscles of tongue glosses 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 so you have the palatoglossus hypoglossus so sorry hyoglossus styloglossus genioglossus the nerves are the vago accessory and the hypoglossal nerve okay so here you have the anterior two third of the tongue and then the posterior one third of the tongue you can see the sensory is the lingual branch of the v3 here you can see the sensory for this is the lingual branch of v3 from the trigeminal this is lingual branch right and for taste it is called at impani from the facial nerve so facial nerve called at impani so if you are able to pick, uh, touch anything with the tip of your tongue and tell the taste that is because of your facial nerve called at impani okay then uh, behind what you have uh, for uh, the posterior for sensory and taste it is one only that is the glossopharyngeal nerve which is going to be a ninth nerve nine which you write like this roman number okay So in the textbook now let us look at carcinoma of tongue they are talking about the pathologic type so you have the non healing ulcer okay so there is an ulcer which does not heal at all so that is a non healing ulcer okay so on the lateral border of the tongue it will be so if this is the tongue this is the lateral border of the tongue right so somewhere the, here there is a non healing ulcer okay so this could be a carcinoma then a proliferative growth with everted edge so if this is the tongue there is some growth here with an everted edge that means everted everted edge okay so there is a growth frozen tongue or indurated variety induration means what hardening something right that's what we read so there's a frozen tongue the tongue is converted into a hard woody mass then fissure variety the tongue is indurated with deep fissure so fissure is more like a cut right um, that is what is a fissure there's a cut there's an opening on the uh, <clears throat> uh, tongue okay so how will they present now let us look at some images wait a bleeding ulcer they will present they will present with an ulcer so here they are showing carcinoma tongue lateral border the most common site they are showing here then uh, they are showing frozen tongue ankyloglossia and uh, dysphagia are present what do you mean by dysphagia you cannot swallow what is ankyloglossia tongue ankylo what is ankylo that's more like a tongue tie what is it a tongue uh, tie they cannot talk, move the tongue freely okay then here they are showing carcinoma of tongue with ankyloglossia disarticulation that's something to do with the teeth isn't it and dysphagia okay then uh, what is this carcinoma posterior one third easily missed so 
you wouldn't see at what is there at the back. So you would easily miss it. So that's what they're trying to say, I think. Look at this. Let's highlight it here in the back of the tongue. Are you able to see here at the back of the tongue here to be more specific? There you go. Okay. So then uh, they're talking about uh, carcinoma tongue excavating ulcer. Then you have carcinoma tongue left lateral border, everted edges and excavating here also. Everted edges excavating. Then you have carcinoma left uh, border tongue in 40 year old man. Okay. What is this one here? They are showing this man with some marking on his chest. Carcinoma tongue with absolute dysphagia, fixed lymph nodes in the neck and involvement of the mediastinal lymph nodes receiving radiotherapy and Ryle's tube feeding. Okay, what are all these marks? But So, these, these people will come to you with what? Some bleeding uh, ulcer uh, from the tongue. Then you have bilateral massive enlargement of the lower deep cervical nodes. So, in an elderly patient, that can be suggestive of a carcinoma of a pros, uh, pos posterior one-third. Okay, He may not even know that there is a growth at the back of his tongue. Now, um, some pearl of wisdom they are telling here. Tongue cancers tend to be more rapid in their onset than other cancers. So, it is very fast. It will come, it seems. So, um, <clears throat> tongue cancers have great potential of lymph node metastasis. That's why they said they will come with uh, enlargement of these nodes. Now, clinical examination, how will you examine this patient? First, let us look at this diagram here. So, lymphatic drainage of the tongue they are showing here. So, here you can go, the tip of the tongue goes to submental, then some of these lateral and middle part are going to submandibular, then this part at the back of the tongue, they are showing it near the internal jugular vein they are draining. Okay. So, what are we trying to look at? Yes, we are trying to look at the carcinoma um, of tongue. <coughs> I have a tongue tie. Um, I'm having a dry throat actually. Okay. So, how will you examine the person? <coughs> Inspection, palpation, all that you will write. Digital palpation, you have to do of the posterior one third of the tongue. So, you have to put your gloves and then palpate and you should not make him get gag reflex. Okay. Be careful. <coughs> So, the ulcer bleeds on touch, they are saying, typically, right? And the surrounding area can be indurated. Surrounding area are indurated. That means hardened. Then check uh, for the mobility of the tongue. Forward, it should be genioglossus. This muscle is mostly involved, so they won't be able to do what it looks like. Then backward, stylo. Back is stylo. And elevation is paletto, you're going to touch the palate. Depression is hyoglossus. So, all these muscles, you're going to check which nerves are um, uh, affected. Hypoglossal nerve mostly. And then you have the palatoglossus. I'm thinking that is for the palatoglossus. Except palatoglossus, which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Backside, you know, no sensory and uh, uh, taste everything, glossopharyngeal only. Bidigital palpation of the mandible should be done. So, you'll palpate mandible area also, okay, which may show thickening. Then lymphatic spread, we told you, right? How it will spread all that we told you in the in the diagram. So this is another pearl of wisdom here. Posterior one third of tongue has very little, very less cornification, but has abundant lymphatics, which explains massive nodes. So it has very, um, it has abundant lymphatics. Let us know the posterior one third of tongue. Okay, so massive nodes will be there because of this, because it has abundant lymphatic drainage. So uh, investigation, what you do, you will take a biopsy, then or Orthopantomogram. What is this? Orthopantomogram. X-ray of the mandible can demonstrate the irregular defect due to invasion, erosion, and pathological fracture. Okay, so this is the X-ray of the mandible, basically they're telling. What are we looking at? Carcinoma of tongue. Now let's look at this box here. Carcinoma of posterior one third of the tongue. There will be dysphagia. There will be change in voice. There can be. There can be change in voice. Right. You can miss it unless you, uh, they're telling, right, you palpate at the back. Then biopsy, you should do under general anesthesia, obviously, because this patient will not cooperate for you, right? And um, um, palpation, we told you, right? You can feel induration. Mainly, they're telling about this word induration. Very important when you palpate. <coughs> then uh, you have to look for, this is one of the occult primaries for lymph node secondaries in the neck. Okay, so this is the primary for the lymph node secondary in the neck. Crisscross, uh, crisscrossing of the lymphatics explain bilateral lymph nodes of the neck. So why bilaterally it gets affected is because there is crisscrossing of these lymphatics. That's what they are saying. So that is bilateral lymph nodes are affected.
okay that's what they are saying blood spread is more common so why did we learn lymphatic drainage that blood spread is more common they are saying prognosis is bad people it is very bad why did they say this happens though uh, bad dentures and uh, etc is it causes i didn't see them tell at all chest x ray you can uh, do to rule out anything routine investigations etc you will do <clears throat> treatment carcinoma of tongue similar to any other carcinoma of the oral cavity what you do you will you have to preserve the function of the tongue remember and then you will have to radiotherapy so carcinoma in c2 what will you do partial glossectomy hemiglossectomy that means little portion of the tongue gone hemiglossectomy around 50% of the tongue gone total glossectomy they are saying glossectomy glossectomy yeah. then how will this person ever eat this can, can carry significant mortality and morbidity so they are showing here in this diagram partial glossectomy so this portion the lateral uh, lesion whatever they are trying to remove hemiglossectomy where 50% of the tongue gone there is one thing called as a commandos operation where what they are doing carcinoma of the tongue if it is fixed to the mandible okay if it is involved with the mandible uh, removal of the floor of the mouth and radical neck dissection wow that will look very very scary to look at that person you will have to go for a um, what do you say recreation of all that so in a radical block dissection of the neck what and all is done you can look at that here so radiotherapy they are talking about for the lymph nodes then um, you have to retain this internal jugular vein at least on one side they are saying to prevent cerebral edema obviously the brain has to drain not in brain drain but causes of death in carcinoma tongue so recurrent aspirational pneumonia can be there yeah because this guy has dysphagia right he might go and swallow into the lungs and cause himself an aspirational pneumonia so obviously you can there can be recurrence and what else hemorrhage this what bleeds on touch even after you there's so much of hemorrhage from growth wow we told you a lot about carcinoma tongue draw a lot of diagrams and you'll get marks okay people need to understand commandos operation is there carcinoma of tongue okay commandos operation radical neck dissection with some glossectomy is hemiglossectomy with hemimandibulectomy hemiglossectomy with hemimandibulectomy okay what is a wound phases of wound healing factors affecting healing okay so wound is something which is more recent okay that can become an ulcer later so wound is a uh, damage to the tissue which is not very old okay so wound so it's a discontinuity discontinuity or break in the surface epithelium okay so that's what we have written here what have we marked yeah later it can become uh, ulcer okay so a uh, wound is simple if skin is involved it is complex if it is involving all nerves vessels tendons so the simple wound and complex wound and um, basically uh, there can be closed wounds and open wounds closed wounds means um, like a abrasion hematoma contusion right those are the things um, so they had didn't put photos here is it <coughs> there be discoloration of skin in uh, contusion abrasion where there are scratches right uh, epidermis of the skin is scraped hematoma it's a collection of blood outside of a blood vessel that becomes a hematoma okay coming to open wounds then you will have an incised wound which will be very clean like a sharp uh, object which will cause lacerated wounds by blunt thing penetrating wounds which kind of you know what they are saying stabbing kind of a thing then crushed or uh, crushed wound you can understand where there is uh, trauma by running over of a vehicle etc which sounds very scary tidy and untidy wounds very important to know if it is contaminated or not because the way you handle things will be very very different in a clean wound and a non clean wound right so surgical classification you have type 1 is clean okay then uh, focus here people acute wound and chronic wound is also there so ulcer comes under chronic wound you understood where the word how is ulcer different from wound chronic wound is ulcer okay healing of the wound okay primary intention secondary intention so there is a primary intention means uh, surgical intention you know, where the uh, layers are close to each other it will uh, produce a neat clean thin scar secondary intention is where it is infected or, or there is skin loss so it will leave an ugly scar so that is secondary intention 
components of wound healing you should know the phases of wound healing people inflammatory phase or the lag phase then you have the proliter proliferative phase or the collagen phase you have to read everything in detail so you have this proto collagen becoming collagen in this and then you have epithelialization then you have remodeling phase or the maturation phase right specialized fibroblast myofibroblast will be the wound contraction will happen here and lastly you have this uh, in this only you have the granulation tissue coming then finally you have the scar formation which is the fourth okay so um so in 12 weeks the max strength of the wound will be reached in scar they are saying this immature scar red raised hard itchy then you have mature scar with less fibroblasts okay then you have in scars itself you have different types like you have the atrophic scar hypertrophic scar and keloid keloid is where it is going beyond the margin of the wound margulans ulcer is something that is after the burns right so they have asked you what is wound etc etc they have asked the phases of wound healing which we told you you have the inflammatory phase then you have the proliferative phase with all the collagen then you have the remodeling then you have the scar formation okay and the cells they are telling you here which and all are there in which and all phase etc you have to look actually this uh, let's just go back here one step look at this margulans also here this is basically uh, any scar you know like burns etc which uh, this uh, squamous cell carcinoma it can become that's why they are very particular about this topic margulans also it can become a squamous cell carcinoma see any scar is becoming a margulans also which is something to do with squamous cell carcinoma malignant it's a malignant epidermal tumor it is a squamous cell carcinoma itself which is arising from this uh, it could be a burn scar or anything it is a squamous cell carcinoma itself it says see so basically factors affecting uh, wound healing so you remember the general factors like age uh, etc you will write so malnutrition vitamin c you should give zinc you should give to people for better healing diabetic patients will have pure, poor uh, immune etc so delayed healing can happen in them so um, what else jaundice or uremic patients also will have delay because of fibroblastic repair which is delayed focus people cytotoxic drugs are there that also will cause uh, a delay like doxorubicin who is taking doxorubicin here malignancy also can delay healing obvious okay so this is an antibiotic doxorubicin so if there's infection there will be delayed healing corticosteroids obviously it will have uh, delayed wound healing because of anti inflammatory activity because it needs inflammatory is the first phase of healing right once this part is done it doesn't interfere it says okay but initially if they are taking steroids it will disturb malnutrition obviously we told you vitamin c zinc and all you should give okay all this technical details you can add if you want so local factors if there's poor blood supply if there is an infection especially this beta hemolytic streptococcus where that uh, fibroblastic activity will be there etc hematoma if it is there it will precipitate infection faulty technique of wound closure here you have to explain suturing and all okay uh, primary uh, uh, intention and all that secondary intention tension while suturing hypoxia if there's no oxygen only how it will heal smoking if they are smoking then how will it heal for them there is elevated carbon di carbon monoxide levels ionizing radiation if radiation is there then obviously there'll be epithelial uh, sorry endothelial cell injury atrophy etc then <clears throat> we cover all the all the factors complications of wound healing also they have written here this is a keloid you can see here how it has gone beyond the uh, scar uh, and this is hypertrophic it is within the margin of the wound elevated but here this is gone beyond the margin and post some uh, healing there can be contracture like they are showing here this is nothing to do this is some other reason though right but there can be some contracture and deformity etc so it is better you explain with uh, some diagrams and with some flow charts also how wound heals phases of healing etc to get marks because it is a very uh, uh, easy topic but you have to give some technical details to get marks in that okay so now let's come back here to the question paper so we have looked at this uh, surgery question paper so what do you think if this paper is given to you will you score more than 50 i mean you can't score more than 50 but i think you will be able to score well right that's all for now guys hope you have enjoyed this session and learned something to pass the surgery exam and pass mbbs bye bye